brought to you in part by Incogni. Congratulations to the log for winning the 8-bit Minecraft mob boat in a huge landslide. Very excited to see this new addition to the game. I can't wait to see what huge changes to the meta this will have. Big thanks to all the voters out there. By the way, we actually had more people vote than in the very first Minecraft mob vote. So there's that for you. <laughs> I'm programming a version of Minecraft that runs on an 8-bit CPU from the 1980s. The game is specifically designed to work for the Commander X16 system. I'm writing this in 6502 assembly entirely from scratch. My biggest challenge? Hubris. I thought I could knock out this whole project in two weeks, maybe a month tops. <sighs> oh to be young and foolish. To recap where we left off last time, we have a chunk rendering system that will take the 16x16x16 16 by 16 by 16 chunk data from a disk and produce the world around Stanley, who is able to move around and between these chunks. It looks pretty cool, but we're missing some key elements here. Let's recall that the computer we're using, the Commander X16, has two graphics layers that we've adjusted to have a resolution of 160x120 pixels in bitmap mode. That means we're defining every single pixel on the screen independently, as opposed to the attempted method using tile mode that we tried before. After rendering each chunk to the screen one block at a time, layer 0 holds the visual output of how the world looks, and the player is able to walk around this screen. Stanley is a sprite, a dedicated bitmap that is able to be placed anywhere on the screen between the layers without affecting the data of those layers. Currently, he's sandwiched between layer 0 and layer 1. We'll see specifically why that arrangement soon. But as it is, his sprite is merely moving around the screen freely. Layer 0's data isn't having any influence on where he can or cannot move. And how can it? Layer 0 is just the name given to this list of bytes in VRAM that represents this image. It's completely separate from the chunk block data. Stanley may as well be walking around on some random painting right now. You and I may look at this block here and say, well clearly that's a block located at this x, y, z coordinate in the chunk's 3D space. But how is the program supposed to know that this pixel here represents part of block 2812? It can't. It's just a blue pixel. It doesn't carry any other data. So while I can't rely on layer 0's graphical information to say where Stanley is, I can create a logical system of 3D positions and collisions using raw math, and then the results of those functions will affect the player's on-screen X and Y sprite coordinates. So where do I stand in all this? Right here. The player's X and Y sprite coordinate is located at the top left of the sprite, but I do all the calculations for where the player is located in relation to the blocks in the chunk using the center pixel of the player's foot what I fondly call the hit bit, along with keeping track of the player's current Z level. We'll call it 7 for this example. Each chunk is rendered starting from the top position, and then drawing 16 blocks up in a column before going to the next column position, and continuing until all 256 columns are drawn. Each block in the chunk has a 12-bit array index, which converts to a non-unique screen position, as in some blocks are perfectly drawn on top of another. And because this position isn't unique, we can't directly convert from a screen coordinate back to this 12-bit array index. But here's a trick we can pull off. Let's ignore the bottom 4 bits of this 12-bit value. This is like dividing by 16. It has the effect that we don't know which number block in the column this is. All we have is a position within the 256 blocks of this layer. Well, if we know that our player is currently standing on layer 7, then we can jump to that layer and check every block to see if they contain our player's hit bit. This calculation isn't helped by the irregular block shape and variable number of blocks per row, but eventually we find the right block. And to get the full 12-bit index of this block in the chunk array, we can just roll the player's current Z back onto this value. By running that calculation every time the player moves, we're able to successfully track which block the player is currently standing on. But to create an interactive 3D environment, we need both gravity and collision. Now, while I'm no physics major, I do enjoy listening to physicists talk about conspiracy theories on podcasts, so it's pretty much my minor at this point. Unfortunately, there are no aliens here to help my code with the heavy lifting. But surprisingly, adding gravity is really simple. We can use that function that we just created to check which block the player is standing on, and if that block is an air block, then gravity can move the player down one block's height. Maybe it's not that simple, I also have to keep track of the current Z height and if that needs to change, along with the gradually increasing downward momentum of the player, and a bunch of other things that make sure that the player successfully moves down by 3 pixels. Collision is a little trickier. 
Again, in the isometric view, there isn't a list of hitboxes I can check against, but I can use the get current block function again to see which block the player will move into in the future by taking the d-pad input, moving them to that new position, and then if the player is inside a solid block in this new position, I return them to the old position, cancelling out the movement. Now comes the point where things really start to get complicated. Stanley can walk in front of a column without any problems, but in 3D space, the player's hit bit won't connect behind a block at the top here, but down one block's height from that. So there needs to be some way that I can show that the player is moving behind this block. But looking at this 8x8 space, the program can't tell which pixels belong to the blocks on top of the player or below the player. Again, it's all just pixel data. What I can do is create a buffer and then check the chunk data for any blocks above the player's current Z that are within the 16x16 16 16 window. After checking each block and drawing all relevant blocks to this buffer, I can place it in the right location on layer 1. And since the sprite is below that layer, this will show up on top of our sprite. By moving this buffer around with the player, we can get some amazing 3D depth effects. This may be a good time to mention that this game won't be played using a keyboard, but a controller. The Commander X16 has two SNES controller ports, so all our controls going forward need to fit on this controller. And now that we can go down, it's about time that we go back up. Jumping is really as simple as pressing the B button and giving Stanley some momentum in the upwards direction, and then letting gravity do its thing and bring him back down. Well, it'd be that simple if you didn't have to keep track of all those same variables that we did before, but in reverse but all that code just gets stuffed into the gravity function anyways. The same collision rules still apply in midair, so you can jump onto a block, but not into a wall. And with that done, we can jump around and have fun doing Minecraft parkour. Dang it. Well, at least everything else works fine, except for that. So before now, I had estimated that everything from the last video until this point would take about a week. It's been six weeks now, and I've come to realize that when programming an assembly, you need to follow one simple rule. Take your estimated timeline and throw it in the trash, because things will always go wrong. Often I was left debugging things for hours or rewriting entire sections of code, and honestly I've glossed over a lot of terrible, awful debugging details because, well, nobody really wants to watch a guy stare at a screen all day, right? So let's get to the most exciting part of Minecraft, resource gathering. Okay, well, the mining part of Minecraft, really. In traditional Minecraft, if you want to mine a block, you look at it and punch it. In my game, Stanley can look around to some degree, but he doesn't have eight directional facing animation or an articulate head. In fact, he's been a little stiff all day. Well, it's hard to loosen up and be animated when you're only three pixels wide. I just couldn't find any reasonable way to animate him walking or even being turned at a 45 degree angle without it turning out like a complete mess, so I think his stoic self is perfect just the way it is right now. And I have another way for the player to be able to interact with the environment. Instead of pointing and clicking, you can control a block cursor, which is able to hover over any of these 9 blocks in the grid around where the player is standing. It isn't just a level plane either, it's a 3D mesh around the player that covers 4 different Z levels. You can use L and R to rotate the cursor through the 9 positions in each layer, and the Y button to move the cursor from one layer to the next. So you can easily select any block in this 36 block mesh around the player. This cursor is a sprite, and it sits between the layers just like the player. Well actually it spins around the player in memory as well. The first sprite listed in the X16's VRAM sprite section has priority over the other sprites listed afterwards. Were I to always have the cursor sprite listed after the player, then it would always appear behind the player sprite, when in reality I need it to sometimes appear on top of the player sprite and sometimes below it. By swapping their VRAM locations at the appropriate time to have the cursor listed first, then the rendering order shifts and the cursor sprite correctly appears on top of Stanley, letting you select any block from the one in front of you to the one behind the top of your head and everywhere in between except those two blocks in the center where Stanley stands. In those positions, the cursor disappears, but that might be useful if you ever want to take a screenshot of that dream house that you've built. And speaking of sprites, this also reminds me of something that was of great concern to a lot of commenters last video. They worry about Stanley getting lost while he's hidden behind some other blocks, and this may be an issue, especially if he does something like, fall down a well, oh no, 
If only the dog had won the mob vote. But what's this? An outline? Yes. When the overlay covers over 75% of the player, the outline sprite is turned on. Now, this sprite is kept on top of layer 1, so it shows up above the overlay, so you're never going to get lost. Now back up top here, we can use the A button to place a block where the cursor is. And wow, that was slow. There are two parts to placing blocks. The first is overriding the current block value in the chunk array. Easy, we just change one byte. And the second is redrawing the block graphic on layer 0. But I'm running into the same problems that we had before. I can redraw the block in the proper position, but that draws it on top of everything else. What if there's a block above it? Well, then I need to redraw the block, and then the one on top of that, and then the one on top of that, and I wind up basically redrawing the whole chunk. So that's what this first attempt shows. This is how slow everything is when I have to redraw the whole screen every time I place a block. But essentially, I'm asking the same question I was asking for the player's overlay. What's on top of this? But this time this isn't the player's hit bit, it's the new block location. And the answer to this question is the same as well. It's the results of calculating an overlay from this position. But instead of taking the results and putting them on layer 1, I only need to take the 8x8 core and add that directly to layer 0, and that updates what the chunk looks like at the block's position, including any blocks on top, beside, or in front of it. This isn't the end of placing blocks, but we have to take a quick detour to get to everybody's actual favorite thing to do in Minecraft. I know, I can hear you all screaming it through your screen, when's he going to get to inventory management? Well, your prayers are about to be answered, my friends. The player's inventory will work very similarly as in other mining and crafting games. There are 8 hotbar slots for the player to use in the overworld, which can be filled with either blocks or items. Oh yeah, I still need to make all the items. Okay, so here are most of the items. You can see I've included copper tools among other things, just trying to undo an injustice here. Not everything is in the final stage yet, notably armor may need to have some more work to be better represented, but I think it's good enough for now. Okay, so back to the inventory. With the X button, you can open the inventory and see all 32 inventory slots, 3 armor slots, no boots if you have no feet, 4 crafting slots, and 1 crafting output slot. Using the D-pad, you can move around the inventory cursor, select an item with A, and then place or swap it with another position by pressing A again. One question I have to answer soon, but not now, is how many items can you carry at once? Each inventory slot is made up of two bytes. The first is the block or item number, being 127 each, and the top bit represents whether it's a block or an item. But the second is a full byte for the number of items. Now, I could give it an arbitrary cap, like 64 items, or I could use the byte's full potential, letting you carry up to 256 of an item. What do you think? In the overworld, you can slide the inventory cursor around on the hotbar by using start plus the d-pad. I think that select plus the d-pad would make more sense naming-wise, but with the controller in your hands, you really can't press select and use the d-pad at the same time, so I've switched it to start. With this, you can choose which blocks from your hotbar to place in the overworld by pressing the A button. And that's a lot of fun. Honestly, it's incredible how much progress has been made and how many systems had to be built in order to be able to walk around in this 3D world, place blocks, build bridges, and... Uh, how do I mine misplaced blocks? Let's come back to that in a second. Let me share some exciting news first. It's time to announce an official name for the game, because I can only keep calling it 8-Bit Minecraft so many times before I get a letter from someone's lawyer. From now on, this game will be officially known as Inkblocks. I'm just kidding, I thought that was a really funny name though. I'm calling it 8-Bit Blocks. And the first alpha release of 8-Bit Blocks is available to download right now. This release allows you to explore a pretty boring world in creative mode. You can explore, build, and mine. This last feature will change eventually, but by long pressing A on a solid block, you'll mine it away and store it in your inventory. Just remember that in order to properly save any builds you've made, you need to exit to the title screen using the select button. Everything in this release is all subject to change, and your feedback will help shape how the game is made going forward. 
with the next big features to be added, including proper mining and terrain generation, which should probably only take me about two weeks, I'd guess. So subscribe to not miss any more updates. Remember to check out Incognate down at the link below, and until next time, thanks for watching.